Hello and welcome to GameSack. Today I figured it'd be a great day to look at the games released by Ultra Games. Now, just who is Ultra Games? Well, I'm glad you asked because I have an overview segment prepared to answer just that. Roll it! Now please. Okay, come on, who is the loser editing this thing? Due to Nintendo's strict and unreasonable demands in the 8-bit days that limited the number of games a single publisher could release, Konami formed Ultra Games in 1988. Ultra Games was a shell subsidiary of Konami of America to get around Nintendo's rules, and Nintendo apparently fell for it because it worked. Konami did the same thing with Palcom in European regions. Ultra Games published titles almost exclusively for the NES and the Game Boy. Many high-profile titles were released under the Ultra Games label throughout its existence. It wasn't too long before Nintendo relaxed many of their bad and often illegal practices, and as a result, Ultra Games was no longer needed. Wow, that was quick. Actually, there's really not a whole lot to tell, but I hope you did like my swooping 3D Ultra Games logos and stuff. I mean, wasn't that fun? Anyway, I'm not going to talk about every single game that Ultra Games released, but I am going to talk about most of them. And I'm going to do it in chronological order so you can experience the company's life almost as if you were there yourself. Anyway, let's begin. Metal Gear on the NES was the first game released under the Ultra Games label, and it came out in June of 1988. This originally came out on the MSX2 computer, and the NES port here came out only five months later. Hideo Kojima was not personally involved with this port. In this game, you play a solid snake, and you're dropped behind enemy lines right at the start. Your mission is to infiltrate Outer Heaven and destroy the Metal Gear weapon. You start off with only a pack of cigarettes. Somehow this got past Nintendo sensors, which is actually the thing that surprises me the most with this one. The game is largely based on stealth, so you want to do your best not to be seen by the enemy if you can. They'll probably smell you though because you're a smoker and, well, you stink. If they do see you, they start bum-rushing you like crazy. The good news though is all you have to do is exit the screen and the entire compound suddenly forgets that you're even there. I like that. Along the way, you collect items to help you out or rations to keep you alive. They changed the game from the MSX2 version in some ways, but it's still pretty similar once you get inside anyway. On the NES here, you now start outside. I'm not a huge fan of the screens out here as they just loop if you go the wrong way. That's only a minor gripe though. I like the graphics and I really like the music. The gameplay takes some getting used to and you really need to learn what to do and where to go. You only get one life and if you die, you start back at the beginning, but at least you keep your items. There's also a password feature, which certainly helps. This title was a great way to launch the legendary Ultra Games brand. Skater Die came next on the NES in December of that same year, and it was adapted from a computer game. I remember some people back in the day talking about this one like it was a good game, but I'm pretty sure they were on drugs. You have a hub screen where you can skate to different events in order to compete. Everything here reminds me of California games, only less good if you can believe that. The half pipe here especially brings back those memories with equally crappy control. In some events, you can choose between regular foot and goofy foot. Regular foot basically means that you press in the direction that you want your skater to go. Goofy foot is more like tank controls, always pressing up to go forward and left and right to rotate. Both methods suck and are way too slow, but honestly, goofy foot is much better than normal foot. I remember seeing pictures of the joust event here in magazines, and I was never a fan of how grainy it looked. The NES can do a much better looking bowl than this. I mean, the shading doesn't even really make it look concave. It is the best event in the game though, and it's fun jousting against your opponent. Otherwise, the game is kind of boring, and there aren't even any bees to chase you. Skate or die? Gonna have to go with death on this one. Alright, so far we've got one classic game and one wannabe classic game. This next one is definitely a classic game, at least in the arcade. 
Qbert came out for the NES in February of 1989. I love Qbert. The goal is to change the color of all the platforms to a certain color, but the evil bad guys are trying to get you. Some will even change the colors back so you need to go change them again. The evil snake boss Coily is always jumping at you, but he's stupid so you can trick him to jumping to his death. Haha, <laughs> take that idiot. The controls are okay. There's a ton of options for your control and you have to set them up each time you start the game. Sometimes they seem to hesitate during gameplay if you use the more intuitive diagonal method. It's actually best to hold the controller diagonally. This version of the game is okay, but I miss the bright graphics of the arcade as well as the amazing voices, especially when you get hit. The best version of the arcade had a knocker that you could feel when Coily jumps to his death and lands at the bottom of the arcade cabinet. Obviously that's not going to be in the NES game. Overall, it's a decent port, I suppose. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the NES was the first game from the franchise, released in June of 89. I suppose that Konami wanted to give the Ultra Games label some legitimacy with a popular licensed property. This one is a bit odd, but not unusual for the time. You start out wandering around an overhead map. You can even attack enemies here. If you go into a door or a manhole, you'll suddenly be playing a side-scrolling level. Your turtle has several attacks and he also has a really floaty jump. You can pause and switch between any of the four turtles at any time. The great news is that they each have their own life bar, which basically means you get four lives. You can switch to a different turtle when your life gets low and then switch back to the injured one if you come across a piece of pizza later which will restore some of your life. You basically need to make your way through the side-scrolling areas in order to advance the overhead map. And you know, I kind of really like this game. I remember back when retro games started becoming popular and a lot of YouTube channels of the time were really dumping on this one. It is really not that bad at all. There are a few issues though. For one, this game flickers like no tomorrow. There's tons of flicker and weird graphical glitches in this one. And while the music is good, the Turtles theme isn't anywhere that I've heard anyway, though I have to admit that I haven't beaten this one yet. Oh, and who can forget these lovely underwater levels? I like it when I lose my last life right as I'm about to disarm the final bomb. Super fun. Oh well, check this one out, it's actually pretty enjoyable. Ultra Games' first release on the Game Boy was Motocross Maniacs in January of 1990. This one starts out kind of promising with you racing crazy motocross tracks with loops and kooky jumps and all that. It kind of reminds me of those Trials games that were popular way back in the Xbox 360 generation. Remember that stuff? This of course is a much simplified version. I really wanted to like this game as I first started playing, but I quickly became annoyed due to the fidgety control scheme. You have a gas button and a nitro button. As long as you have nitros, you're probably going to do well, but if you run out, you're pretty much screwed because there's no way to jump. You can kind of float upwards by holding up, but it's all very weird. There are some icons to grab to gain more nitros, more time, more speed, or better tires to go faster in the sand. You have to pop a wheelie to ride over these rocks on the ground, but you need to be very precise with your timing. Crashes don't hurt you, but they do knock some time off of the time bar. The time is your biggest enemy, so basically this is a racing game, I suppose. Your goal is to complete two laps before the time runs out. After I got used to the controls, which took about 10 minutes honestly, I started to have some fun. Not mountain loads of fun or anything, but I do find the game kind of enjoyable. Completing the first lap became very easy for me, but the time bar made finishing the race pretty difficult on most levels. I like the music here as well, and I think you should play this one for at least 15 minutes to see if you'd enjoy it. Snake's Revenge on the NES was next in April of 1990, and this is a sequel to Metal Gear. This isn't anything like Metal Gear 2 though, and this Metal Gear adventure is exclusive to the console. In fact, this game wasn't even released in Japan at all. As you can probably imagine, Hideo Kojima wasn't involved, but it pissed him off enough that he went and made the real Metal Gear 2 for the MSX2. Anyway, once again, you're Solid Snake. Yep, that's supposed to be Solid Snake. 
It takes place three years after the first game and you need to destroy Metal Gear again. Should have just done it right the first time, Snake. It works in a similar manner to the first game with some redone elements. The menu screen got a facelift, for example. However, I don't like how the return command is located in different positions at the bottom of the screen at different times. Just pick a spot and keep it there. That's user interface 101. This time when you're spotted, you can't just run off screen. You have to kill a few enemies and then everyone else calms down. The music is much different. I like it, but I think that the first game had tunes that were more fitting. When you die and select continue, you don't have any of your items anymore and you have to do everything again, which is annoying. It's not boring or anything, but I say stick to the original. Nemesis on the Game Boy also came out in April of 1990. This is a shooter in the Gradius series, but they called it Nemesis to trick people into thinking that Ultra Games was a legit company and not an evil shell corporation doing Konami's bidding. Anyway, it plays just like Gradius. Collect the orbs which will move the box on the bottom of the screen one notch. Once the box gets to where you want it to be, press another button to power up. All your power ups go away if you die though. It mostly plays well, but it can be tough to tell what part of the backgrounds can hurt you and what can't. Still, the visuals and music are great, even in monochrome. Anyway, check this one out if you like Gradius. And whoa, you definitely want to check it out if you like Gradius. That's right, Ultra Games is an evil shady shell corporation trying to trick you and other sheeples just like you. I mean, check out their TV ad. I'm the creator of Ultra Games for Nintendo. Yeah, that's the creator. Just try and tell me that he's not evil. The next one up is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Fall of the Foot Clan on the Game Boy, released in August of 1990. This is another side-scrolling Turtles game that plays a bit more like Bad Dudes than the game on the NES. It is, however, way better than Bad Dudes. April is once again kidnapped as that seems to be the only reason that she exists. At the beginning of each stage, you can choose your turtle. You then proceed through each level and there may be several different scenes in any given stage. You can jump and attack with your turtle's chosen weapon. If you crouch, you can throw stars. You can also kick objects in the air as you jump. And that's about it. The NES game had more moves, that's for sure. Speaking of moves, this game moves really, really slow. Yeah, sorry, that was a pretty bad segue. Supposedly, these earlier games tended to move slow to prevent screen blurring on the original Game Boy. It's set up kind of like the NES game in that you have four lives, one for each turtle. You can't switch between them willy-nilly as you play, though. Also, their weapons all look like they're made out of rubber. Seriously, look at that. The good news though is that the sprites are large and there's even some basic parallax scrolling in a lot of places. The music isn't bad either, and you certainly get the turtle's theme in this one. Unfortunately, I started zoning out a bit after I was playing for a while. It gets pretty boring killing jumping foot soldiers again and again and again and again. Different enemies are introduced in higher levels, but you'll still see more foot soldiers and rolling black balls than anything else. Overall, this is a decent effort and worth a try, but I like the NES game a lot more. Mission Impossible came out for the NES in September of 1990. This one's based on the TV show since obviously the movies didn't exist yet. I don't think I've ever seen the TV show and this is my first time playing the game. This is an overhead free roaming action style game. You start out with a mission to rescue some guy and his secretary. As you wander around the street, some people will just randomly start charging at you. You can go ahead and kill these people. But if you kill any one of the identical looking other characters who aren't charging at you, you lose a life. You can wander into buildings to get clues. Sometimes the buildings are just full of bad guys, but eh, sometimes they might have a good item for you. 
Eventually, you'll make your way to the sewers and wander around down there. There's a lot of wandering around in this game while simultaneously trying to wreck the bad guys. It's extremely easy to die, I didn't even need to try, it just happens. And when it does, you'll switch to one of the other characters which has a different attack. You can also switch between them at any time, and in this regard, it's similar to the first Turtles game. The game has nice graphics and music, but I really couldn't get into the gameplay much. Everything just kind of looks the same, and all of the wandering gets boring after a bit. I don't think I've played this game enough to call it a bad game or a good game or anything, but I can probably say that it's not for me. Next up is Roller Games for the NES, which was also released in September of 1990. It's based on the TV show Roller Games, which ran for one season from 1989 to 1990. Just wait till you see these skaters take on the 14-foot high wall of death. It could be devastating. Does anyone remember this show? It was pretty crazy. He's got him up to the rail! He's pulling him up! Oh, the team are winning! Fight that gator! Get away from him! It could be devastating! Get that man out of the pit! Not necessarily good, just, you know, crazy. The game here, of course, tries to capitalize on the hype of the show. Basically, the owner has been kidnapped by the bad teams, and only the good teams can save them. You can choose from one of the three good teams. I like that the girl team is called Hot Flash. I wonder how that would go over if such a thing happened these days. Too bad one of the guy teams isn't called Erectile Dysfunction. Anyway, the game plays as a lackluster but still interesting beat-em-up. This is one of those games where I swear I used to like it a lot more, but playing it now, not so much for some reason. Still, I do love the concept of a beat-em-up on roller skates. It's literally never been done before this game. I mean, besides DJ Boy on the Genesis and the arcade. The action is fun as you platform your way around in what appears to be a very post-apocalyptic city as there are bottomless pits everywhere. I mean serious, look at this, where are my tax dollars going? The enemies are fun to fight except for the ones that take a bunch of hits. That's because as you're stuck beating them up, another one will come and attack you and there's no way to avoid it. You get into a combo and you can't break free from it so the other guys just pummel on you. The graphics are decent, and the music is pretty good as usual from Konami, but for whatever reason, I just wasn't having as much fun with this game this time. Korth was released for the Game Boy in December of 1990. This one tries to disguise itself as a shooter puzzle hybrid, but make no mistake, it's 100% puzzle. And that's fine. After choosing your level and a ship to control, basically your goal is to shoot blocks to fill up shapes that are scrolling towards you. Each block that you shoot adds onto the shape and you need to make it a rectangle. Once that happens, it turns into squares that are counted down as they disappear. You need to get a certain amount to qualify. You can make the shapes as large as you like in order to get more squares as they disappear. Doing so will often net you a special item that you can use, such as the ability to freeze the playfield as you fill up shapes. The levels will keep going long after you qualify. As a result, this game is definitely more of a time waster than anything. You play it to pass the time because you literally have nothing better to do, like if you're waiting in the shop for your car to get fixed or something. For that purpose, it fits the bill quite nicely. It's certainly not bad, but it's not something that I'd choose to play if I wanted to spend an evening gaming. <laughs> December of 1990 also brought us Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game for the NES. 
This was based on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game, and I guess they didn't want to confuse the kiddies, so they called it Turtles 2. Actually, they were probably more concerned with not confusing the parents who bought the games. Can't really blame them, honestly. You already have Turtles for the Nintendo, little Jimmy. But Mom, this is Turtles 2! I don't know why I gave the mom such a deep voice. Anyway, Konami would keep this numbering scheme going all the way until Turtles in Time on the Super NES. This is a beat-em-up, and it's a somewhat decent port of the arcade game. Actually, as far as presentation goes, it's quite good for an NES arcade port. Two players can even play at the same time. It's more or less fine in two-player mode, but you'll get pummeled fast playing with yourself. I mean, by yourself. Although all of the foot soldiers die after only two hits, you can really only get one hit on them before they hit you right back. So you need to hit them once, get out of the way if you can, and then hit them again. This sounds easy, but there are always three enemies on screen at once. If you kill one, another immediately runs onto the screen, so you're almost always being swarmed. They don't increase the number of enemies in the two-player game, so that makes it much easier. Your jump kick takes you nearly across the entire screen, so it takes a while to get used to attacking enemies this way. The home version here does feature some extended as well as new stages, which is a good thing, as the arcade version was quite short. You even have new bosses like this guy who I don't remember from the cartoon. The best part, though, is that it's sponsored by Pizza Hut. It even came with a free coupon, and if you don't still have that, then your copy is not complete. And you should feel bad about that. How dare you not have a complete copy? If you can't detect my sarcasm there, I'm sorry, I just don't know what to say to you. Overall, I personally feel that the first Turtles is a better NES game than this one, just slightly, but this one certainly isn't bad at all. Not by any means. As far as the Turtles beat-em-up games go, I always preferred Turtles in Time the most. Future Turtles games from Konami wouldn't be released under the Ultra Games banner, even on the NES. I wonder if that confused any kids or parents back then. Alright, I've got five more games on my list that came out in the last year of Ultra Games Life, and a few of them are actually really good. Well, a couple of them anyway. Ski or Die came out in February of 1991 for the NES. It's been four years. Is this any better than Skate or Die? Oh god yes. You still have the Skate Shop or Ski Shop rather, and as well as the same overhead screen to choose the event you want to compete in. At least most of the events here are somewhat fun though. The half pipe is quite enjoyable, even though I probably suck at it. You can do tricks and collect items for points, and I feel it controls well. I also really like the forward scrolling perspective. Inner Tube Thrash reminds me of a crappy version of the arcade game Tubin. It's kind of slow, but you can pick up items to help you get ahead of your enemy. This one is an awful, but it's probably my least favorite event in the game. Acro Aerials is really fun as you do a ski jump and try to pull off tricks in the air. You also need to make sure that you land safely. Then, you'll be judged on your performance or lack thereof. You get three tries, just like Winter Heat on the 32-bit Sega Saturn! Downhill is exactly what you'd expect, downhill skiing. This is the only event where you can choose between regular and goofy controls. Both work much better here than they did in Skate or Die, but still could be a little bit faster. The last event is Snowball Blast, where you throw snowballs at people as they try to throw snowballs at you. You have people coming at you from 360 different degrees, and you need to switch the view, which is kind of odd at first. The little window at the bottom of the screen tells you how many people are in each direction. You can even collect items to help you out. I really had a lot of fun with this one, but I do wish that I could see the snowballs that I'm supposedly throwing. Overall, this is a huge improvement over Skate or Die, and for once, I don't want to choose Death instead. Check it out! Also in February of 1991, Operation C came out on the Game Boy. This one is a run and gun game kind of like, wait, isn't there a run and gun game on the NES called Super C which was from Konami? And this one is Operation C and it seems very similar. 
Hmm, I think that people might have started putting two and two together at this point, figuring out that maybe Ultra Games is just a shady shell corporation just pushing more Konami games onto the population. Maybe even Nintendo started to realize the truth with the release of this game. Probably not the smartest move you could make, Ultra Games. They're on to you now. Anyway, this one is a really good run and gun. Contra made a fantastic transition to the Game Boy here. The control is still a touch slow, especially in these overhead stages, but it's still much better than most of the earlier games on the handheld. The weapons are typical for a Contra game, but it's most like Super C, which you've probably already surmised. I like the H weapon the most, which hunts down on-screen enemies while you take care to avoid enemy fire. It's a little bit weaker than other power-ups, but it's often worth it. Each weapon can increase in firepower if you collect multiples of the same power-up as well. The graphics and music probably couldn't be much better for the Game Boy. The stereo capabilities of the Game Boy add a lot to the tunes here. I'd say that this is a must-have for the system, wouldn't you? Blades of Steel came out on the Game Boy in August of 1991. Okay, now they aren't even trying. They are literally using the same name as Konami's NES games now. I think the jig's gonna be up soon. Anyway, I don't really have much to say about this hockey game, except that I suck at it. Even so, the NES version is way better. The scrolling here is choppy and disorienting. Fights break out randomly and last maybe two seconds. Even the cool voices that were in the NES version are completely gone. Just play the NES version instead. Ultra Golf came out in March of 1992, and it was one of the last two games released under the Ultra Games label. I guess they wanted to release a couple of more games under this label so employees of the Evil Shell Corporation could get some extra money for St. Patrick's Day. They're gonna need it too because they'll soon turn to drinking once they find out that they have no jobs next month. Anyway, this is a pretty basic golf game. The swing meter takes a bit of getting used to. Once you do, the game is still fairly mediocre. At least there's some decent music as you play. What can I say? It's an average golf game. The final title from Ultra Games was World Circuit Series for the Game Boy. It was released in March of 1992. This is a rather generic overhead racing game, but it can still be fun. Basically, you spend most of your time racing against absolutely nobody for 7 or 800 laps to qualify for a position. Then you race against actual opponents for 3 laps. I'm not sure why there are so many more laps for qualifying, must be an F1 rule, but this is a video game so we don't need that here. Not that pole position matters much anyway because the enemy cars here seem to have no collision. You can literally go right through them. Even if you qualify in last place, it's super easy to finish in first. Trust me, you're gonna be seeing this screen a lot. As you race or qualify, you'll see a message if you need to pit and repair your car. Just ignore it, especially during the races. Trust me, you'll still win. The music is good, but it can be tough to hear over the noise that's supposed to represent your engine. This game would be a lot more fun if I weren't spending the large majority of my time qualifying for a race that I'm just gonna win no matter what. Well, there you go, that's Ultra Games. Actually, they also did release Metal Gear and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the PC and Commodore 64 in addition to what they released for the NES and the Game Boy. Also, the PALCOM releases over in Europe were slightly different than what we got with the Ultra Games releases over here. So what do you think of Ultra Games? Should Konami bring back that label to focus on video games or do you think Konami is just a lost cause altogether? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. I'm
I'm the creator of all three games for Nintendo. Like Metal Gear, where you are commando searching for a franchise. Or Defender of the Crown, which is a boring port of a computer game. Or Escape, or Die, which will leave you wondering if your controller is even plugged in. So check out all three games, and remember, I'm never farther than your parents' checkbook.